As I said many times before in my videos, the topic of assumptions and qualitative research is something that should never be ignored. The topic never gets old because it's simply that important. So for this video, I invited Dr. Huai Huang from the University of Edinburgh, who works there as a research fellow, to reflect on the importance of assumptions in research. Uh, before we continue, if you're new to this channel, consider subscribing. And also, if you feel that you have something interesting to say and you'd like to get featured in one of my videos, uh, feel free to contact me through my Facebook page. So now let's see what Huai has to say about assumptions and qualitative research. Hello folks, today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about assumptions in qualitative research. To understand how the assumptions we make feed into qualitative research, one could start by thinking about assumptions as we encounter them in everyday life. Assumptions are an incredibly useful thing to have around. We often assume that tomorrow is not going to be massively different from today, for example. This often turns out to be true, luckily enough. In the world of research, assumptions also play a number of useful roles. In collecting primary research data, assumptions give us a guide and make a difference as to where and how we specifically look. We might be interested in researching leadership behaviours in classrooms, for example. But at the outset of a research investigation, we have a choice. Do we A, assume that it's only teachers who lead in a classroom? Or do we B, allow also for the possible fact that we might see kids displaying leadership behaviours too amongst their peer groups? An example like this is where existing literature on the research topic becomes useful in resolving the dilemma we've just introduced. Maybe the literature tells us that sometimes kids lead and sometimes teachers lead. This fact from the existing literature then directs us in our study to assume that the leadership behaviours we will see may come from either teachers or kids. Being a good researcher, however, we should allow also for the rather unlikely fact that none of our particular teachers or kids are displaying anything resembling leadership behaviour, but only in some of the classrooms we observe. Having talked about how assumptions may flow from the existing literature into your research study, let's go into more depth now to talk more specifically about assumptions in qualitative research. In reading the academic literature, one will at some point come across references to ideas of epistemology and ontology. Both these ideas are particularly interesting in context of academic qualitative research. However, both are difficult to pronounce and even more difficult to remember, I know. But here is a starting point in thinking about these ideas. Epistemology is commonly associated with ideas around how we know stuff, the how of things and coming to know about the world. This is distinct from ideas of ontology, as a way to talk about current and past ideas on the sort of world we assume it is possible to know. Both epistemology and ontology are ideas to help us think about and share with each other our thoughts on different ways of framing our research. One graduate level textbook counts at least 13 distinct types of qualitative frameworks for framing your research topic. Without boring you with the long list of all 13, let us take two of these as helpful illustration of the role of assumptions in qualitative research practice. For the first framing of your research topic, let us turn to past ideas of interpretivism. From the textbook, we know that interpretivist ideas and ideals can be traced back to the world of Immanuel Kant, a famous philosopher who lived from 1724 to 1804. For interpretivists, our natural capacity for interpreting what we sense all around us is an important part of the picture in understanding how we come to know things. Epistemology. Interpretivists like to refer to something we can all relate to, our own journeys through life as we experience it. Interpretivists take our interpretations of the world as the point of departure for coming to know about stuff. And this is assumption is at odds with one common preference of realists. We often vote in favour of observing reality in a relatively value-free way. Without really acknowledging that we all interpret our experiences and trying to make sense of them as we progress through life. Some realists take the correspondence between ideas and relationships 
with our experiences as their first point of departure in learning. It's important for us to note that both interpretivist and realist thoughts are assumptions, or really sets of assumptions, as we noted before, you saw in the world of research. Under a realist framing of leadership behaviours in classrooms, for example, we might try to observe how many children seem to be leaders amongst their peers and how many teachers lead their classrooms. Academic qualitative researchers rarely do maths as their primary research activity, which means that their professional identity is rarely linked to the task of matching mathematical structures to our experiences. That's something for the statisticians, really. This is why many qualitative researchers, particularly academic ones, tend to get involved more in interpretivism rather than realist thinking, for example, as they deepen their expertise and craft. Under interpretivist framing of your research topic, your primary source of data is around sharing interpretations of experiences. Instead of counting, we have talking in research participants sharing their reflections on leadership behaviours in classrooms, for example. For our second framing of a qualitative research topic, let us think together about past ideas from symbolic interactionism. As one alternative to interpretivist ways of coming to know your data, this way of thinking about how to know stuff adheres to the following two principal assumptions. Assumption number one, people act towards things based on the meaning the things have for them. Assumption number two, these meanings are derived from social interaction and modified through interpretation. To see the general truth in the first assumption, just try to imagine a world in which the things that others you interact with hold no personal meaning for you whatsoever. Personally, I find it difficult to imagine this as a possible feature, but who knows? To see the general truth in the second assumption of symbolic interactionists, let us start by thinking about the last time the meaning of something changed significantly in your life. Maybe it was your job. Maybe there was a significant change in what the job now means in the new year for you. Or maybe a personal memento, for example, which seems to have taken on a new layer of meaning after your dear grandma unfortunately passed away. Going back to our second assumption of symbolic interactionism, the derivation of meaning from social interaction bit of the definition and what symbolic interactionists think about can be seen in how we come to know mathematics in a meaningful way. So one question for you now is how you came to know your mathematical ideas that you're currently familiar with. For example, the idea of number as you count things. Did the meaning of these ideas and definitions of these ideas come to you through socialisation and social interaction, for example, in the classroom. Or even if you disagree with thought of mathematical knowledge through socialisation and education, can you at least see and accept why some others might see the things this way? For quantitative research, the assumption that meanings of things are modifiable through interpretation, for example, like symbolic interactionists believe, can be incredibly distasteful and the best unhelpful on first glance. So just imagine that you are trying to promote and teach the ideal of replicable measurement to the next generation. How on earth can one reconcile the idea of your measurements being replicable to others alongside the idea that the meaning of these measurements can indeed change from person to person? Luckily, we were all taught to understand quantitative measurement in a pretty standardised way at school, thus largely foregoing the possibility of the same quantitative data differing much in its basic meanings to two or more of us. When it comes to higher level meanings for quantitative data, however, for example, in discussion or data interpretation sections of quantitative research papers, the meaning of quantitative data can and do sometimes differ, significantly depending on which peer reviewer you ask. So to summarise, in this video, we've introduced two schools of past thought on how we come to know stuff. The first is interpretivism, the popular way of thinking about qualitative research tracing back to European thought in the 17 to 1800s. For interpretivist researchers, a key assumption in their studies is in trusting in human interpretation. This trust can be seen in terms of shared interpretations of data, 
interpretations of the evidence as one talks about literature, for example, rather than primary data, and also experiences from both the researcher and the researched, a source of data for knowledge. A second set of useful assumptions for doing qualitative research comes from the land of symbolic interactions. For researchers interested in this way of coming to know about things, the development of meanings about things, which is a key part of both central principles of symbolic interactionism, meanings, the social development, and interpretive modifications by people, is a central professional interest to the symbolic interactionist researcher.